What is up my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Mode Studios, where every week I share new top real estate agent and entrepreneur interviews, along with tips that I'm personally doing inside my business that have allowed me to become one of the top real estate agents and team leaders on the planet. Check us out at gsdmode.com where you can see more free, great content, tips, interviews, resources, trainings, and more that will help you massively grow your real estate business. Also, make sure to check out my personal mentorship coaching program at 90daymastery.com. This is for those of you wanting to create a truly successful real estate business that pays you the money you want as well as gives you the time and freedom to live a life worth living. This is hands down the best, most effective, and most affordable real estate coaching program that exists out there. Thank you so much for all of your support. Now, let's dive on in to today's content. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview where every single week I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, and straight up top badass that they're dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out and create big, amazing, epic lives for them, their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, got another amazing rock star guest on the show. So our guest today, you guys, is a real estate company uh, owner, owns PLG, uh, PLG Estates, which is focused on serving the who's who of the entertainment world. Started off in Beverly Hills. Now they're all over the LA area. Um, his team consists of over 200 rock star agents. He's also the co-host of the popular Netflix series, Stay Here. And this is a guy that, if you guys want to know how to do social media right, do your YouTube videos right, um, to, to just deliver great content. Like, this is a guy you all need to be following and learning from. So I'm really stoked and honored to have Peter Lormer on the show. Show my friend. Dude, Joshua, can you call me? Every morning and just recite that because <laughs> shit, that's a pretty good yeah. intro, dude. I'm like, oh wow, yeah, you made me feel very proud. And sometimes, yeah. as an entrepreneur, you wake up in the morning and you're like, hmm, am I at the bottom of the pile, the middle of the pile, or the top of the pile? And and you just you just made the afternoon all bright and lovely, me old mate. So yeah, well, that's man. awesome, man. No, it's an honor's mine, man. This this is awesome, and and you're out there crushing it, doing so many big things, and. You know, I am curious, though, that you just – with the comment that you just made, you know, because one of these things that does become tough for entrepreneurs is, you know, we kind of have this, like, never satisfied mentality, you right. know. And, and, you know, and, and there are days, man. It's ups, downs, highs, lows, you know, right? Um, but you're a dude that gets up and, you know, does it every day, you know, right? Um, and I'm sure there's days, like, when you watch your YouTube channel, you have so much energy and you just bring it every video. And, and I'm sure there's times where, like, you're getting ready to hit the play button and you're like, man, I don't want to do this. Don't – like – you know, like how, how do you how do you get yourself in the state to when you're having those those down moments to just continue to perform? You know, it's and this is this is a, a really great question. Forget, I hope it's not too echoey for your uh, for your viewers. I'm in my office here in in LA, and it's a little echoey. But um, you know, motivation is a word that we throw around in in all industries, uh, but especially guys, you know, like like ours and. I, I'm very motivated by lots of people that I watch on YouTube every single day. Um, but my natural default setting, and I want, I wonder if this is, if this is, if this is a thread for most entrepreneurs, my natural default setting, if I sit still and think is it's quicksand, right? I begin to, I have, I suffer from the syndrome known as one day I will live under a bridge. Right, I always think that, that perhaps today is the first day of the beginning of the end of my success. And I know that that's a very common theme. Um, I think they call it imposter syndrome. So one thing I always do to combat it is, I always just remain in action, right? I remain in action and I remain in service. So I try, I try and always focus on putting out as opposed to what I'm getting in, right? I kind of let that take care of itself. I stay out of expectations and I stay in action. That's the key. If I could sum it up in one sentence, I stay in action and out of expectations. Yeah, I love that. It's powerful stuff, man. So then, 
I, I'm really curious because you're, I mean, you're doing so many things today, but I'm always curious before we get into all the cool things that you're doing now, I'm always curious in our, our guest journeys that led them here in the first place. So how did this whole entrepreneur journey start for you and, and how did real estate enter that? Uh, okay. My initial thought is, do I tell you the absolute truth or do I tell you what I think I want you to hear? Yeah. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be respectful, Josh, and tell you the absolute truth. So I think the journey as an entrepreneur began way before I even realized it began. And everything I did, I wanted to do it to the max. And it isn't because I think I'm good or I'm great. In fact, if anything... I have the normal insecurities, very much like everyone else. But my, my, my first love affair was music, right? I was a, a classical musician, um, and I just went at it, and I was given a free scholarship to the Royal College of Music for being an exceptional classical trombonist at 13. And then I discovered house music, ooch, 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 in the mid-'80s, um, and I was like, right, screw the trombone. I'm going to head off to London to go do that. So I dropped out of high school at 15 to go become a record producer. Now, I didn't know a soul, dude. I didn't know anyone. And I caught the Greyhound bus from my town, which is a town like Pittsburgh, to London and kind of got off at the other end. And I found the biggest street in London. Uh, and I went into every store and I lied about my age and I asked for a job and I got it, finally got a job. And that was my, I just knew that failure was never going to be an option. And I was going to be a successful record producer as I was working in the women's underwear department at this department store <laughs> on Oxford street in London. And, and, and then, you know, I just kind of worked my way into the club scene in London and, and I, I, I had, um, right place, right time. I was in a nightclub. Somebody said, you play the piano? I'm like, yep. He said, you know computers? I said, yep. And then my record career was born. I was in the band. Then I was working in studios. And then I had, I, I was at the birth of the British electronic music scene. I had about 25 number ones in the, in the British uh, club charts. Working with bands. I'm going to show my age now, Joshua. Going as far back as like David Bowie, George Michael, um, In Excess, had some big hits with those guys. And then skip forward to around 1993, 94, I moved to the United States because I thought there was going to be a massive dance explosion and it didn't happen, but I was here and I implanted myself in the American dance music scene and had about another 30 number ones in the Billboard Club charts. Toured the world as a DJ, this is the part where do I tell you the truth? You want the truth, right? Yeah, always the truth, man. <laughs> <laughs> nothing but the truth. <laughs> um, so the club scene is fab fabulous, but it was a very unhealthy lifestyle, if you know what I mean. Lots of sex and drugs and rock and roll, which was awesome for a decade and a half. But then I'm like, you know what, dude, this is going to kill me. So I wanted to kind of get out of that industry. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I was dating this girl who was just horrible. And she was toxic, in fact. And she managed to fold this business she had in, in LA and get into real estate. And... Um, and she was successful at it. And I'm like, well, she's, she's horrible. She's a bad, horrible person. So she can do it. I can do it. And so I took a bunch of the money I'd made from the last couple of years of the records. And I started investing it into property in LA. And I just kind of had a knack for it. And, and then the creatives of LA were like, my mates in the music business were like, we don't really trust the suits. Can you help us? So... I got my license, one thing led to another. I joined Keller Williams. Then I was the number one Keller Williams agent in LA County after five years. And then I started my own firm because I wanted a, a hub for creatives in real estate because I couldn't find any. And uh, looked at my wife as we opened a store no bigger than a barbershop and uh, said it's gonna succeed or fail, but at least it's ours. And we've got four offices now, 175 agents. Yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome, man. So then 
you know, when you enter the real estate, the real estate business, when you join Keller Williams, you know, because within your first five years, you're the number one agent in LA County. And that can, I mean, it's so saturated and so many huge producers, you know, right. um, kind of walk us through, because when people hear that, that might be watching this, you know, because we, we get these, let these limiting beliefs slip in, you know, where it's like, oh, well, he just was connected, you know, right? I didn't have to work hard. He was just connected, you know, right? And, and, you know, there might've been some connections there, but I know that you don't, you don't nah. get to that success without hustling your ass off. So in those first few years are just so important. And so many agents, we have 90% of agents drop out in the first three years, right? Can you walk us through those early stages, those early sure. years and kind of walk, you know, whether you, how you tapped into your sphere of influence and the other things that you did to create that such high level success in five years? So that's a great question, Joshua. So, one of the most instrument, I don't know who told me this, and I, I hope one day I remember, but somebody told me to get a book. And the book they told me to get, I'm sure you probably got it on the shelf behind you, is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And what I liked about that book was it was a manual, not a novel. It gave me a roadmap to success and call me stupid, but I believed what he was saying in the book, like you will be successful if you follow this. You need a white hot obsession with what you're doing. I also kind of knew, because real estate tends to be a, a second career for most of us. I knew that I had to cut the, the, the limb off, uh, the tree up at the limb or whatever the phrase is with the music business. So I literally went to bed a record producer and the next morning I woke up a realtor and I never looked back. And it would have been very tempting to keep dabbling in both worlds, but I knew I couldn't. And I had this same burning desire in my mind that I had as that kid dropping out of high school at 15 to become a record producer. And I just would, would not allow failure to even enter the equation. Now, yes, I was connected in the music business, but nobody in the music business worked with me in the first few years. My first sale was in a really bad part of LA, which I won't mention the name of it because I don't know if I want to offend people. It was a cheap house in a shitty neighborhood. My second sale was a listing in the project of Oxnard, which is an hour's drive north of LA for 200,000 bucks. My third deal was a 300,000 single bedroom apartment overlooking the 101 freeway in LA. And I would have, t I, my pride was non-existent. My ego was non-existent. I would have shown you a tool shed in the South Bay if you wanted me to. And my feeling was, and this is before I discovered people like Gary and Grant Cardone, but I was a very big believer in giving, 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 because then I have emotional leverage. So I was just unstoppable. I was like flypaper. Any lead that came near me, I was just on it. And I was obsessed. I remember not being able to turn my mind off for 12 hours a day for literally the first three to four years. Yeah. And I, I had a new baby. I had a new wife. I had a new life, a new job. I was... Shit, I'm really telling you the stuff now. I was newly sober. You know, I've been sober 18 years. And uh, uh, it was like, can I swear on your podcast? It's get shit done mode, man. So tear it up. <laughs> I was like, you know, what the fuck else am I going to do? I'm just going to do this shit until the wheels come off. Because if I give it every ounce of strength that I've got and I fail... At least I know I failed. Then maybe I'll go drive a bus or maybe I'll be a sailor or a coal miner. But I need to, for everything that I, I attempt, I have to go at a thousand miles a minute. Because if it, because to me, failure isn't something I fear. I, I kind of welcome it in a way. Yeah. Love it, man. So then do you, do you think that a huge part of, uh, I guess it, because you have a high level confidence, you know, and, and yeah, failure can happen, you know, uh, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it can, it can happen. Right. And, but man, I mean, I can't even imagine just leaving my hometown. I'm 15 years old and going and doing that, but you created a lot of success with it, you know, and I'm sure there was a lot of obstacles 
Well, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a whole book and a movie, just that journey in its own or, or multiple movies. Right. So, but do you think that tapping into those early wins like you did allowed you to have the confidence to, to, you know, just jump all in like that, like you did? I don't know. I, I guess shit, dude, you're digging deep stuff out. I, I I have always, and this is a, and I don't wish to kind of like mention the sobriety thing. It, it isn't who I am. It's just part of who I am. But there is a common thread, I think, with entrepreneurs and with, with people that have addiction problems, which is they have a less than mentality, right? And I, I, I have always never enjoyed the, the kind of glory. I enjoy the kind of, I like to get my shit done and then, and then stay out of the results. You know, I don't want to bathe in the glory of success because I, I'm convinced the moment I do, I'll turn to a pillar of salt and it will all go tits up and I will be under that bridge. So I just keep staying in action. And no, I don't think early success gave me confidence. I think it was just, a, a, I mean, I didn't come from anything. My parents were both working class. I think it came from, I had no, nothing to fall back on. Yeah. So I, I just went for it. And, and I will say this to you, Joshua. When I was a kid, God rest my, my father's soul. He's been dead a long time now. But when I was a kid, my father was a, was a great, he was a lecturer at Bradford University in Yorkshire. Uh, technical college, actually. And, and he was a very accomplished jazz sax player, right? And he inspired me to, to take up music, take up trombone. And when I was about 13 or 14, I was saying, I want to go professional. And my father gave me this piece of advice, which was very well intended. He said, why don't you get good grades? And then why don't you pursue playing in bands on an evening? You just need to get a good job and support yourself and da, 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 da. Good advice. I remember saying this to him at 13. I said, dad, I've got to give it everything I've got right now. I've got to burn my boat at the shore. I didn't say that because I borrowed that from Napoleon Hill. But I said, I've got to give it, give it everything I've got because if I don't, I'll kick myself for the rest of my life. And I said, i got nothing to lose right now. I'm just a kid. And he looked at me as if to say, wow, holy shit. You know, I wish that, you, my dad always wanted to live in America. And here I am, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. I don't really know <laughs> what fuels it, dude. I really yeah. don't. I just no, that's know awesome. That it's an insatiable beast that's never full. Yeah. You know? Well, and the reason why, you know, I, I, I'd go deeper and ask some of these questions is you meet so many people that, man, they have all the potential. They have so much, you know, talent potential and, and they know what to do, you know, and they have these goals, but they just don't do it. They don't get into the, into action like you do, you know, right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to see, you know, right. Um, so much wasted talent out there, but yeah. unfortunately it exists. And I still prospect every day yeah that's awesome i hate it as much as i did the first day 15 yeah. years ago but i know that and i i am a big big believer in advert in, in sphere right that's where i get all my business i don't buy online leads um and i know the way to get business is to politely check in with my people i know sort of know could know might know and i there's no secret to this the top producers that I know, the very vast majority of the top producers, we all prospect every single day. And none of us jump up in the morning going, I can't wait to write those 20 emails or make those 10 phone calls. We all hate it, but we all do it. And for your listeners out there, if you're a new agent, I'm going to go out in the limb here. Don't hate me for this. In my opinion, door knocking sucks. Cold calls suck. If you live in a town that you've lived there for more than a couple of years, you have a sphere of influence. Work through the people you know, sort of know, could know, might know. Have coffee with people. Go to these stupid events. Go to barbecues. Go to parties that you don't want to go to. Increase your sphere. Increase your network. Because in my opinion, that is where all the business lies. 87% of deals come from people you know. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, and, it, and it's, you know, door knocking 
e even if it maybe it's somewhat effective if somebody's door knocking or cold calling which i've i've always hated it myself and and always wanted to build a business where i attract people and not chase you know and but it, it's not scalable if i have to knock 100 doors a day well i can't you know right but if you have a great connection that person can tell their three friends about you and, and it just compounds you know it's it becomes so huge so then um yeah, I mean, let's let's jump into that, man. I mean, what when it comes to, you because know, a lot of you said if you're a new agent, you know, tapping into that. But I, I talk to so many new agents that are, have a big fear of it because they like, man, I don't want to sound like that salesy, you know, douchey realtor in their face, and you know, they don't want to beg them for referrals and different things. What what, do, what would you recommend, and what do you do, and what would you recommend to go deep in those relationships? Because I truly feel it's more important now today than it's ever been. So the way that I did it, because scripts and dialogues is something that I've never really been a part of. I, I've never liked practicing what I'm going to say. So the way that I did it was I came from an angle of service. So instead of calling people up, people in my sphere and saying, hey, have you thought about buying or selling this year? It's a great time. Da, 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 da. I would call up my people and I would check in on them. I would ask about their family. I would ask about the kids. And then I would say to them, hey, you know that I'm doing real estate now. Is there anything I can be of service? You know, you want to talk about paint colors? I'll be happy to come over and look at the landscaping. You know, you, you're thinking about doing an extension. Don't worry about buying or selling. I'll just be happy to come over and chat and have a coffee. It'd be nice to see you anyway. And I did that a thousand times. And that's where my business came from. Because again, I was giving something, not just asking for something. I was giving my time and my expertise and my opinion. And that's another thing that I made a trade, not a trademark of, but was a cornerstone of my, my business. Hang on, something coming in. Sorry about that. That's okay. Was, was a cornerstone of my business, which was the following. Um, I, oh God, what was he about to say? I was about to say something really good and it's gone, it's the phone call through me. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. Carry uh, on, Joshua. Yep. You, know, you, you talked about, um, you know, not buying online leads, but I know that you're very active on social media and, and you yeah. do a lot of business out of social media. And I think a lot of realtors, when they hear, oh, well, I'm getting business from Facebook, they automatically just think I'm doing Facebook ads. Yeah, right. Um, and, and, you know, Facebook ads, especially in the last year, man, it's, you know, a lead that used to cost me four bucks is now costing me 14 bucks, you know, and it's just going to continue to go up in that space. And, um, uh, so I'm really intrigued, man. Like, wh how are you utilizing social media to deepen those connections and to, to broaden that sphere and, and to get that business coming in? So, um, another really interesting question. So, <clears throat> when I when I was at Keller Williams and Facebook, I was on MySpace and then Facebook came out and somebody showed me Facebook and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, this is it, this is everything. This is going to be the way that we get business. It was just a light bulb moment for me. Um, and so I then thought about, I, I, I'm always a person that I don't like to do what everyone else is doing because for me, the odds are just too high. So if everybody's doing postcards, I don't want to do postcards because it's just too, too high. The, the cost is too high. So I looked around and coming out of the music business, I was very familiar with how people creatively marketed themselves or a band or a club night or a record or a whatever. And I'm like, well, nobody's really doing that in the, in the real estate space. So I thought, shit, I'll do it. I'm just going to have a crack at it. So I started putting out content that I thought my sphere of influence would be either entertained or they would find informational or uh, infotainment, right? One, a, a blend of the both. And so I just launched into that because my content was unique. And I knew that if they watched it, I had had a captive audience. So skip forward, how do I utilize that in, with today's Facebook? So with today's Facebook, I will t take a piece of content and I have mine's twofold because I own a brokerage. So I go after the real estate industry, but then I also go after clients. So as far as clients are concerned, I will do a vlog, a really great vlog of maybe visiting Inman in San Francisco or me taking a family trip with the kids. 
and I'll splice it together and I'll make it look beautiful. Then I will post it on Facebook, but then I will do a sponsored post to all of my sphere. So I know for damn sure that all of my sphere are getting that really well edited, beautifully tailored piece of content. And then I prospect my sphere. And this is the reaction that everybody has, Joshua. They say, well, the ones that pick up or the ones that reach back. They go, oh, Pete, that's so funny. I was just watching that thing of you in Jackson Hole with the kids uh, dog sledding. That was really funny. So what I've done is I've warmed up someone in the deep, dark crevices of my database by creating content. I wish it was as simple as creating content and I just reel in the leads. Nope. I create content and then I still prospect the people that I'm sponsoring that post to. Yeah. That's the magic. Yeah. I love it. You know, cause it's, it's one of these things where tactics like Facebook is a tactic, right? But tactics sure. never make you money. Yeah. Right. It's, it's strategy that makes you money and you've got a, a strategy behind that tactic that works really well for you. Um, you do, do you ever, when you're doing that, I mean, is there such a thing as, you know, I mean, like back in the day when I would hear Cardone to talk about, oh, well, I'm going to do, you know, 12 Facebook posts a day, you know, right? Well, in 2015, 14, I was like, ah, my, it seemed like excessive. But now today with the reach it being so low, you know, um, it, it, I mean, do you ever, is, there, is there a point where you've got to do a certain level to even make a, a dent, to even make enough? And then is there such a thing as too much? So I remember standing in front of Gary V, right? And it, this was actually on one of my vlogs. And I said to Gary, this is before, this is, I don't know, maybe three years ago. And I said, Gary, can you ever put out too much content? And he said, nope. And I said, can you ever have too many flavors of content? And he went, absolutely not. And I then had my answer. Now, that's whatever it was, 2015, 2016. In 2019, going into 2020, I am feeling, because I can't keep up with Gary. I can't keep up with Grant Cardone. I, I don't want to keep up with them because the amount of content they're putting out is just massive. So I kind of fall in the middle. I will put out a decent amount of content and I'll try and make that content high, more high quality. Not saying that theirs isn't, theirs is awesome. But with the resources I have, I'll try and do as much as I can um, as often as I can. And I have reached a point where I'm happy with one main post on, on um, Instagram a day. Facebook is going through its own thing right now. Facebook is a bit of a sleepy animal unless you're advertising on it. Um, and, and so I think you can put out too much content. If all your content is watered down, but there's a lot of it, I don't think it's going to work. If it's really good ton content that isn't once a week, it has to be, you know, at least three to five times a week. I think you'll create a, a good audience through that. Yeah. Love it. So then you, you've got the vlog stuff, which is, you know, you're doing a lot of cool different things out there with, with just your business, your family, all of that. But is there also, is there a mix though that you do or you recommend of also, you, whether it's uh, uh, real estate, new listings, closings, um, local things taking place that your clientele yeah. might want to know more about. Yeah. So if I was, so I'm going to give you the strategy that I deployed when I was an agent. When I was an agent, I intentionally, I intentionally blended my personal and business into one feed. Right. When I was a, uh, 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 Keller Williams, they said, and it was very well-intentioned advice. They said to me, nope, you need to have a business account and you need to have a personal account. But then a little light bulb went off in my head, which was the people that like me personally will put up seeing my professional stuff. And then they will also be reminded of what profession I'm in. And then the people that want to follow me professionally will then see my personal stuff and hopefully get something from it. And that was what I doubled and tripled down on when I was a, a, an agent at a different firm. And I still firmly believe to, for your viewers out there, I feel you should be blending. It's kind of a third, and a, a third and a third. A third should be personal. A third should be your, you in your industry. 
and then a third should be about your industry. And it should all be contained in, in one feed. And if that's uh, a business page on Facebook, you can still put personal post posts on that. And then you can market those posts to your crowd. So I think relying just on, on a Facebook personal page is, is antiquated. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And, and, you know, my, one of my coaches and mentors, Darren Hardy, you know, the way, the way that he classifies Facebook is, is, or just all social media as being though, it's, he's like, it's just the modern day reality TV. The difference though, is you get to be the star of your own channel, you know? And, right. and if we look at actual television networks, the number one most watched thing is reality TV. And it's crazy how engaged people are, but you have to have, an intentional strategy to it like you're doing where most people are just randomly posting with no strategy behind it, you know, right? Yeah. And, and I have made the decision, you know, kind of after the show really, because I noticed that a lot of the people that were following me on Instagram didn't really care about the family. And then I've got my, my people in LA, my sphere that really care about the family, which is why I just started a personal Instagram page and I'm just going to go hard on the business on my main page. Yeah, love it, love it. So then, you know, with your YouTube channel, because you, YouTube's, a, you know, they're, they're all different beasts in, in their own way, you know, right? And, you know, I mean, your YouTube channel is, uh, you know, one of the best examples that I've seen out there from anybody that I know in the real estate space with, I mean, you've got a dial, then you've got your playlist, you've got, you know, everything with a, a catchy thumbnail. Then you get in, it's like, you got, you got the title and the hook, then it goes to the intro and then the content. And, you know, um, you know, can you, can you kind of walk us through like some of the learning lessons that you've had with YouTube of, <laughs> you know, like what doesn't work and what does work? Cause I can tell that, you know, um, Oh you know, my God. At least what you're doing now appears to be really dialed in. So I'm assuming it's working well. So YouTube has been my nemesis. It has been a beast. I have been so despondent with YouTube. So when I first started, you know, Gary was a very, a very good example to me. And now I have realized with YouTube, I think I've finally just cracked the code, which is why my viewership over the past few months, over the past couple of months actually has finally taken off. YouTube is a, is a one lane highway. So if you're going to be doing content on YouTube, people want to see this like a TV show. If you're tuning in to see cheers, you want to see people sitting at the bar every week. I, what I was doing is I was doing a blog and then I was doing a rant and then I was doing a movie and then I was doing a lattes with Lorimer and then I was doing a this. And it was like a variation of stuff. On, on, on Instagram, they liked that. On Facebook, they liked that. On YouTube, they didn't. So on YouTube, there are a million videos on how to make the perfect uh, uh, sticky video. Essentially, it's this. In the first six seconds, you need to talk about what the video is. Then you go into a bumper. Then you go into the main video. You've got to have a great title, which I completely dropped the ball on for the first three or four years. I thought, you know, maybe what is home equity was a great title. It isn't. It should be secret, top five secrets to tapping into home equity exposed. That's a great title. And so I learned that the hard way. And then thumbnails, I learned that the hard way. But YouTube, I will say this, I think YouTube still has a long long way to go and I think it's got a long way to go because of this my generation when I google something if I type in you know uh, best reviews of flat screen TVs I put it well I don't but people my age put it into Google people who are 35 and under put it into YouTube and that switch is happening now so I think YouTube as a search engine hasn't even begun to unleash the power it contains. So if you feel you're too late for it, you're not. It's never too late for anything. You just got to get in the elevator and you got to do your very best to make sure it goes up. Yeah. Yeah. Now with, with all these, cause I mean, there's so many different mediums out there. Um, I was actually watching a, 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 a podcast or not a podcast, but a YouTube video from Alex Becker uh, yesterday. And he's like, look, going forward to that, especially is to why not in 2019 and getting to 2020, 
with all these different changes going on, he's like, man, you, you just go deep on one thing. He's like, and just own that thing, mash that thing. He's like, you know, it's like, I can go knock on all these doors each once, or I can knock on this door a thousand times. And, you know, eventually that door is going to pop open. You know, do you, would you recommend somebody just going deep on one instead of trying to master all these different things? As in platforms, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, all hey, strategies man, in real estate. No, no. Well, I mean, it's, it, I guess it kind of applies to, you know, the gin source or, or whatever, but you know, more, more, I'm just speaking to the social media platform, like, you know, right. Instead of just trying to flash it all over all these different networks, like just going deep and just be there on one thing and focus your time on really mastering that one thing. Great question. No, I would say, because if you like, for example, let's talk about it, right? Snapchat. There were some really big, or oh, people on Vine. There were some really big people on Vine, really big, that put all of their effort into Vine. And then Vine ultimately, you know, died. Um, so I think right now, the white space is LinkedIn. I think there's a lot of room on LinkedIn for people to make a dent. And also, you can cross-pollinate your content. So when I do... Um, a Monday mantra, for example, I'll do a Monday mantra live on Instagram. Then I will also be filming it in 4k on my Canon camera so that I can then chop that into micro content. I then send off the file to rev.com to get, to get transcribed. So then I've got written content and then I can turn it into various one minute videos over the years on Instagram. So I think the most important thing isn't platform. It's library. You need to create content because you can always shift it around. Like I'm using, I'm going, I've just, I'm just dipping my toe into the water of TikTok and I'm using TikTok as a place to record videos and then send them to Instagram stories. So content is everything. Platforms, not so much. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Powerful stuff. So, um, you know, I, I'm just, I mean, how'd the whole Netflix thing come about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, so, that's a crazy thing, man. So the Netflix show, literally, I would like to say, Joshua, uh, you know, they were, it is nothing more than, I wasn't looking for a TV show. I, I'm not an agent. There's a lot of agents in LA that are part-time actors. I'm not one of them. I wasn't looking to be on the telly. And I got a call from a, a casting agent that said, um, do you want to host a show on Netflix? And I'm like, uh, sure. Yeah. And I actually thought it was someone goofing around with me. And, um, they found me on YouTube. They found good old Pete Lorimer on YouTube and me and Justin Bieber were discovered on YouTube. And, uh, and then they called me in and, and I was very kind of balls to the wall. Like, you know, you probably want some skinny dude that doesn't have this, horrible accent that wears suits and screams at women. I'm like, I'm none of those. So I'll gladly refer you to some people if you would like. And they were like, uh, actually, no, no, no. We kind of like you. We like that you're a little bit more rebellious and loud and da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay. And I will tell you this. I don't even know if I've said this on a podcast yet. My, that little voice of living under a bridge I didn't unpack my suitcase on the set of Stay Here until the second week because I thought I was going to get this. You're going home. You're going home, Pete. See you later. And uh, I, I finally unpacked my case in the third destination, which I think was upstate New York. Um, and then after the show, you know, a lot of doors have opened and I'm like, okay, great. Let's walk through them. Let's see what happens. Yeah. It was a real, a real, it was a fun time. Do, is it, is it uh, I mean, a lot of great experiences I'm sure there and, you know, has it, has, was it worth it? Oh, it was, it was so worth it. And, and when I think about it, I was almost flippant about it in the beginning because I didn't think I was going to get it. And I was actually at the Inman conference when they were doing what they call the chemistry test. And they said, we're flying in the host on Thursday. We need you to be there. I'm like, I'm at Inman and I'm sorry, I'm speaking. I can't make it. I'm like, best of luck with whoever you find. 
And then they flew me down uh, that night and I did the chemistry test with Genevieve that night. Um, and what it has done, it's kind of reignited the creative beast because I was a songwriter and a record guy. So writing to me is, is, is second nature. It's kind of a release. So I'm in the process of, I've developed about another 10 shows and uh, I've filmed sizzle reels for two or three of them. And I'm, sh uh, who knows? Maybe one or two of them will get picked up. I don't know. Yeah. And then of course there'll be hopefully another season of Stay Here. Yeah, that's so awesome. You know, I always get asked with, with the podcast from other people that are maybe thinking about starting a podcast. So like, well, you know, does it, how much revenue comes from it? And I'm like, look, man, you're asking the wrong questions, you know, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, it, some of it's hard to track, whatever. I mean, the, the true brilliance of this, though, is, you know, if there was no money ever in it, I would still do it. I get to sit down and pick brilliant brains like yours all day. I mean, but where else do you get these opportunities, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like Jim Rohn said, you know, never ask yourself, what am I going to get out of this? Always ask yourself, who am I going to become from this experience? Or, or I look at what I can give to it. And I don't want that to sound cheesy or schmaltzy, but I was like, wow, I'm going to have the opportunity to do a TV show for Netflix. That's pretty great if it is nothing more than me sitting around the table with my grandchildren saying, your granddad, well, you know, <laughs> 30 years ago had a show on Netflix. And what it's done is, do I think there was direct business from it? Probably not that much, you know, but did it bring some, uh, a layer of, of fluffiness and authenticity and acceptance and endorsement to my company plg yeah for sure for sure yeah for sure yeah love it man so you know you're you're in the the mecca of of luxury real estate and and you know i know when you first got into it you had some intimidation and some fears there and and i think that anybody that's gets involved with that you know is going to ha maybe have some of those fears you know can you kind of walk us through you know, what, what that was like getting into it and, and maybe how you overcame some of those fears or maybe they were just false fears that ended up, I mean, they were ex existed and then you realize, well, these were, you know, something I didn't need to be fearful of. Um, but I am really curious because you do, you've done so much luxury real estate over the years of, you know, the differences of, you know, cause my average price point here in Phoenix is we're like 285,000, you know, um, and you know, I've never seen like how highest price point house that will sell on an annual basis is maybe like 1.5 million. I can't fathom selling $50 million homes. You know, so like, what do you see as the differences too from those high end luxury clients from what you have to do to sell it, what you have to do to work with the client, get the business versus your regular real estate out there? So I remember the first time that I was taking one of my first celebrity clients to look at a house um, and he's a big British actor. Uh, I'm so tempted to say, I suppose I could. You guys can figure it out. He's in a, he's in a franchise with The Rock. Let's just say that. Um, anyway, so me and him were out looking at houses and, and I hadn't shown a lot of uh, luxury real estate. And I remember walking in this $5 million house. This is maybe 12, 13 years ago when a $5 million house was like the equivalent of a $30 million house in LA now. And I was actually trembling. As I walked in, I was trembling. And I had all of these insecurities of like, shit, I don't really know what I'm doing. Oh my God, people are going to figure out that I don't know my way around luxury. And, and oh shit, this is all going to end badly. And then I kind of, gave myself a talking to in my head and I said, Pete, calm down. It still only has one kitchen. It has a master bedroom. It has a master bathroom with a toilet in it. It has a living room and it has a garage. It just, they just all happen to be bigger and a bit more fancy. And as soon as I kind of got my head around that, everything changed. Now I have been lucky enough to sell a lot of very expensive houses. But for the most part, I will say this, and this might surprise some of your listeners and viewers. I would much rather sell 10 $1 million house, houses than sell one 10 million. Let me rephrase that. I would much rather sell 10 $1 million houses than one 10 million. 
And people are like, but the commission, that's $250,000. I find number one, they are so much more work as they should be, but also the clientele changes. I don't want to be somebody's bitch all the time. And I've had some wonderful, very expensive clients who I work with continuously. But I know, a bunch, I, know, I know all of the big agents. I know all of the million dollar listing agents. They're all my mates. And I'm not saying these guys do this, but I know some other luxury guys that are essentially on call 24 hours a day. If they could be at their own wedding, and their clients would demand they step away. I got three children that are my life. They are my everything. And so if I want to work with great people, I'll work with them. And if it's a high price point, great. But ah, they are worth to me just as much as someone that wants to spend 300 grand on their first purchase. And again, I'm not saying that to be this cool dude. Uh, I, I, that's what I believe. Well, and then in addition to that though, too, if you look at it from a business standpoint, and if you have 10 $1 million deals in escrow, let's just say one falls out, we got the other nine. You know, the one 10 million yeah. falls out. I mean, there's just so many more vulnerabilities, right? If you're- Correct. And then out, let's, let's talk about that, Joshua. So how many $1 million buyers are there in LA? Well, out of 100 buyers, 97 of them or 95 of them are one and a half million and below. So I'm looking for that 5%. And when you get above 5 million, you're talking about maybe one buyer in a thousand. So the odds get really narrow. And I, I you know, it's, I, I, I enjoy doing it, but I enjoy, I enjoy regular folk just as much. If, in fact, if anything, I enjoy regular folk more. Yeah, love it. So then you mentioned the, the one house that you showed, the $5 million house. But <coughs> then now today it'd be like a $30 million house. So yeah. You got this just like this rapid appreciation, man. And it's, you know, second longest bull market in recorded history. And, and we all know what's, what, you know, what goes up must come down. And, and, you know, what we're seeing, I mean, yeah, loans are more solid and, but it, you know, it's just, I can't fathom that this is sustainable. And it, it, I mean, what, what do you, what are your recommendations? Um, Cause uh, we've both been licensed for about the same amount of time. You know, I, I'm 14 years, 2005 and, yeah. you know, market was like this when I got started and then, you know, my market dropped about 85%, you know, right. Um, you know, what are you doing to prepare for, for whatever the next correction looks like? Um, you know, there's so many different debates on, on how severe that's going to be, but then, you know, what advice would you give for others? So I believe what I'm about to say to my very bones I believe that you, the agent, are the brand, not your company, and I own a company, but I believe you, the agent, are your brand. So for example, this is why I like boutique, because here at PLG, I really strongly advise all my agents to make themselves memorable, come up with their own branding, with their own slogans, with their own social media, with their own videos, don't have generic stuff done for you or, or only generic stuff done for you. Pushing yourself out uh, into your tribe. If you are, you know, if you like rave music like I do, <coughs> don't be embarrassed to say that. Even don't be embarrassed to mention your political beliefs. Don't be embarrassed to really own who you are because you will attract business. I think our industry, and in large part, this is due to the, the, the kind of collapse of the majors right now, because they're all a bit lost apart from Compass. But Compass is, it's a great company, but I just think it's vanillaizing our industry. And, and for, for someone like me, that's a great thing because everybody looks and feels the same. Whereas if you can own who you are, and if you can go the extra mile with your social media, if you can do creative stuff, you mentioned it, this is not rocket science. Get out there with a camera crew, go and interview local coffee shops, restaurants, boutiques, single moms, just own it, own it, own, own who you are and what you're about through media, because media is the only thing that separates us from each other. Everybody in real estate that I know 
everyone, everyone that's my, no, another phone call. Everyone that's a client of mine knows my social media and what I'm about, what I like and what I dislike. And that makes me stand out. I think the kiss of death for an agent is when your company just provides everything generic. It's, you have to use the company branding. You have to use the company colors. All the marketing looks the same, whether you're a rookie or you're a veteran. I just think when the correction comes, those of us that boldly stand out will become more of the go-to guys than just the vanilla crowd. Now, I really believe that. Now, do you, I mean, because you're, when you're talking about standing out, I mean, you, you're a guy that stands out with, with, and from day one, you're like, hey, I want to be different. And, you know, you, you, as you told the, the Netflix uh, executive in the interview of, I'm, I'm the rebel, you know, or they called you the rebel, you know, but I mean, that takes, man, you gotta, you gotta be bold. Like you gotta, you gotta have some guts, you know, right. To go out. Cause it's scary when you don't conform. And, you know, um, I don't know if you've had a moment where, when you're choosing to go down this beat your own drum versus kind of go down the pack of everybody else where you're like, man, like, you know, this is a cover. I'm not sure if this is the right thing or those that might be feeling that way, you know, cause it's, it could go great. Or I remember hearing a, 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 a conversation about Will Smith and Eminem when Eminem was first, like when Dre first discovered him, Will Smith told him, you're either going to be the greatest thing the rap industry's ever seen, or you're going to be the biggest laughing stock. But he's like, there's going to be no in between. And I'm sure at that point, Eminem was probably like, holy shit, you know, right? But thank God he chose to, you know, move forward with it. And, you know, is now the number one rated rapper out there. But, you know, have you been to that? And then if so, like, what, what type of recommendations would you give or advice would you give to get people to just, just to be authentic and be true to themselves and be to their own drum? So there are, there are essentially two things that hold us back, um, which is, well, the number one thing is fear. Right? What if I get it wrong? I'm going to lose my clients. I'm going to lose my business. People are going to laugh at me. Um, and I find if fear is the motivator, it is always the wrong motivator. For me, it's always been faith. I've always had faith in myself, not necessarily to get it right, but I've had faith that I'm going to attack whatever I do with my own flavor. Because for me, if I'm going to die a slow, painful death of mediocrity, that to me is the worst thing in life. Whereas if I'm going to blow up my own career by, by, by running a, a video for a, a, a thousand miles a minute and it just doesn't work and I don't get any business, I'm like, that's fine. But being scared to put a foot wrong will be the death of so many people in this industry. It used to be, when I was even taught, my, my first office manager said to me, Peter, you've got to appeal to everyone all the time. That's how you get business. You've got to appeal to the grandma in the, in the condo in the valley, and then you've got to appeal to the millionaire by the beach. And that never jived. So me trying to appeal to everyone all the time means that we will end up being very mediocre. I say, go after the people that you connect with. Maybe it's people that do sailing. Maybe it's people that like rock music. Maybe it's people that like rock climbing. But there are groups of people that you have a magnetism to and, and for that you'll be able to get business from. Stop chasing Zillow leads. Stop chasing the internet leads and go after real people that you can make a connection with. That's where the business comes from. But it, it would be like me hanging out with accountants. I can't talk their language. I wouldn't know what to say. I'm going to seem like a fraud, but I can hang out with ravers all day and get their business. Yeah. So I would say, know who you are, know your tribe and go for it. Don't play in the middle because that's a slow death. Go the extra mile because as Grant Cardone, Cardone says, if you go the extra mile, there's no one there. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So um, I know we're going long on time. So just two, two last questions for you. Um, you know, I mean, you're, you're a guy that has great high energy, you know, right? Um, and you, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the, I guess the natural direction that your mind can go, kind of go to more of a negative place of thinking, you know, living under the bridge. And, Doc. you know, so, so I'm guessing that, you know, all, this is very intentional, you know, right? With your energy, because it's not just, it's not just your energy of, you know, just high energy, but it's like, man, like you're a guy that, 
lives life. And you can tell that, man, you're, you're creating a lot of success in business, but you're creating a lot of success with your kids. And man, you're just having fun in life. And that becomes such a fine line in entrepreneurship, you know? And, and I mean, I, I struggle with this now, you know, right? Where it's, you know, you get so in your business where then it's kind of, you kind of, it's kind of hard to enjoy some of the other things sometimes. And, you know, um, you know, like, what do you do to, you know, to, I guess, to intentionally go out there and just friggin' live, live life, have the energy that you do and, and get it all done. It is a very long process. It has been a long process for me to figure this out. But I, a lot of, in fact, a very large part of the success of, of my real estate business and, and PLG, the company that I own, is owed to my lovely wife. My wife is my partner, not just in life and with our family, but in also all my business. She uh, was a refugee from Vietnam and she was born a Buddhist. And if you marry a Buddhist, after a while, it begins to rub off on you. And so where I'm at right now, how I balance is the shining light for me is always my children. Now, does that mean that I'm, you know, staring at them at breakfast, coming home when they're at school, uh, being there at home when, when they come home from school? No, but I will say this, I sculpt my day so that I can have dinner with my children every single night. Now, I might go off and work after that, but my family comes first. I'm at the point mentally where I completely trust in the process of the universe. I'm getting deep here. And my job, every single, this is how I look at life, Joshua. This is how I live every single day. I am standing in front of a conveyor belt. And every morning, a box comes down that conveyor belt with a big pink bow on it and today's day. I open the box and I look inside, sometimes there's puppies and sometimes there's rainbows and sometimes there's dog shit and hand grenades. But I look at it as that is what's happening for today. Now, naturally I plan things and I have goals, but my job is to turn up every day, give everything I've got 150%, but then I leave the results up to the universe. And if I remain in service and out of selfish, my life just continues to improve. Being of service means if somebody wants to cut me off on the freeway, let them in. Being of service means if, if I'm late for an appointment, not getting angry at the guy that won't ho hold open the door for me because it was my fault that I was late, not his. And just these little techniques allow me, and, and, I, and I'm going to say this, this is the biggest one of all. And I don't want to sound schmaltzy. Everything I say, I mean, so I hope this comes off correctly. I wake up every morning, my eyes open. I look at my three beautiful children. I look at the woman I love, who's fantastic. I wake up in LA. I'm from the cold north of England. And I live in a house that I love. I go to work with people that I love. And I got a great client base. I've already won. Every day is my worst day is the majority of this planet's best day that they can hope for. So I have got nothing to complain about. And I, and I think that that just comes, I'm in gratitude. I'm in gratitude all the time. Yeah, so amazing. Yeah, it's all perspective, right? <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. No, love it, man. Yeah, it's, it all comes down to, to perspective, you know, and it's, it's so powerful. It's, it's awesome stuff. So our right, last question for you. Knowing everything that you know now today, if you could, the Peter today could go have a conversation with Peter 15 years ago when you first started this journey and give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would just fast forward your trajectory to success. Again, knowing everything you know now today, what would those two pieces of advice look like? Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Don't second guess. Trust in the process that the type of person that you are, Peter, 15 years ago, means there is no handbook, there are no footprints to follow, and that's just you. That doesn't make you better or worse than anyone else. 
but just trust that instinct 1,000%. When I listen to my heart, I do great. When I listen to my head, I go wrong. I've always got to listen to my heart, my gut. Yeah, love it. Powerful stuff. And those that want to follow, check out your YouTube channel, which I highly recommend everybody does that. Um, subscribe, follow, hit that bell on everyone so you can, you yes, can check out all the great content because, I mean, it's <laughs> – it's amazing content. Um, and, and just, you know, not, not even just for like modeling after, but I found myself just getting so fired up by just watching it, just, just from a motivational standpoint. Plus there's just so much great information for all of us to grow our business. So um, uh, if they want to follow you on social media, you know, we, if somebody's listening to this and they're in your area and they want to potentially join your brokerage, like where are all the best places to get a hold of you? All right. So the, the, my handle on Instagram is at Peter Lorimer. My handle on Facebook is Peter Lorimer official. YouTube is Peter Lorimer official. My cell phone number is 310-666-PETE. Yes, that is my real number. 310-666-PETE. Yeah, awesome. Love it. And those that are watching, listen, we'll make it super easy on you. Wherever you're at, those will be right below. So you can just click on those and, and connect with Peter and make sure that you do. And I know you end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it that gives you the power to go out there and create the, the life you know you want and deserve. And Peter shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Make sure to take something that you learned and go out there and take that action on it. So again, you will create that life that you know you want and deserve. And Peter, man, I know how busy you are and i truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. Pleasure. it's been so much fun and a huge honor it's a pleasure thank you so much joshua you, you rock mate yeah you got it my friend thank you and thank you guys for watching us we'll see you next time peace thank you